Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, December 26, 2021. We are in lesson four of unit one for the winter quarter, which is entitled, the unit title, unit one title is God Requires Justice. God Requires Justice. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. Our lesson title from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly is The Consequences of Justice. The Consequences of Justice. Devotional reading is taken from Exodus chapter 34 verses 1 to 10. Our background scripture is Nahum chapter 1. And our printed passage is Nahum chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 verses 6 to 8 verses 12 and 13 and 15. And our key verse from the King James Version is God is jealous and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves, reserveth rather wrath for his enemies. That's Nahum chapter 1 verse 2. The aims of from the quarterly uh, or number one study how God delivers justice through the prophecy of Nahum number two experience how though rather how through the belief that God's justice will prevail again that's experience hope through the belief that God's justice will prevail and then number three, identify ways to serve those who have not been treated justly. After the introduction, the lesson has three divisions. The first is entitled, A Jealous God. And that's covered between Nahum chapter 1, verse 1 to 3a. Second division is entitled, No Escape. And that's covered between... Nahum chapter 1 verse 3b and 6 to 8 verses 6 to 8 and then the third is condemnation and vindication that's covered between Nahum chapter 1 verse 12 13 and 15 from the standard commentary our lesson title is justice and deliverance justice and deliverance and additional aims are number one summarize the historical context of Nahum's prophecy and number two explain why God why God's justice is necessary to the spread of the good news or the gospel then number three explain how to present the gospel both in terms of God's wrath and salvation available through Christ and a lot can be said uh, right up front here. Uh, the justice that we avoid uh, as sinners is because uh, Christ uh, took the punishment for our, 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 our unrighteousness. He took the punishment of the wrath of God. He endured the wrath of God for our sins. So we'll say more about that as we get into the lesson. But Let's have a quick word of prayer and we'll say a little more about the background uh, and then we'll get into some verse by verse discussion of the lesson. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, while we might think that there might be a more appropriate lesson um, here uh, in the Advent season uh, and just having celebrated uh Christmas, Lord, um, that uh, the, the entry of the Savior of the world into time and space to redeem us. Uh, we know that there is uh, certainly uh, a loving, uh, caring, uh, merciful uh, God as well, you, you are rather, as well as a God of justice. And Lord, we know that uh, all sins uh, will be paid for either by ourselves or by the one who bore our sins on the cross our Lord Jesus Christ so you are righteous but you are yet merciful you are just and the justifier 
We thank you again for this privilege to study your word. We pray, as always, that you give us a clear understanding of your word. And as we get a clear understanding, that you would increase our faith. And as you increase our faith, you would increase our obedience, Lord. We ask the, your blessings upon all who the hearers, the families represented, uh, throughout the balance of this year, and Lord, your blessings through all the new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, there is uh, a lot that could be said uh, in the way of background on the the small book of Nahum. Uh, Nahum, uh, his prophecy basically dealt with two things. Uh, the destruction of Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, uh, and also uh, the uh, the redemption, if you will, of Judah, uh, the uh, removal of Assyria as an oppressor of Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, having said that, um, Nahum was... Uh, sort of a sequel to Jonah. Uh, if you know your Bible, you know that approximately a hundred years earlier, God had sent Jonah to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, which was rising in power at that time, as a world power at that time, but was rife with evil. And he preached uh, judgment, a judgment to come if they did not repent within 40 days. And as you all know, they did repent and sackcloth and ashes and they reformed their ways and they, uh, and God, uh, God decided not to judge them at that time. Fast forward a hundred years, they have degraded into all kinds of evil and debauchery and unrighteousness. Uh, they are cruel um, with their their enemies that they have overtaken. They have risen to power. In fact, they uh, the zenith uh, they rose to their zenith of power between 669 and 633 BC, uh, having already taken um, the northern kingdom into captivity in 722 BC. And, and by the way, uh, they took the northern kingdom into captivity uh, as an instrument of God in judging his own people for their continuous evil, their continuous spiral down, uh, practicing idolatry and all manner of wickedness. And God used the Assyrians to judge his own people, as he will later use the Babylonians to judge the southern kingdom. And if you know, again, your Bible, you know that it was, he used the Babylonians to destroy Nineveh, which was the capital again of Assyria, and that ended their world dominance. And, and of course, uh, Babylon came on the scene. They destroyed Nineveh in 612 BC, along with the Medes, but uh, predominantly uh, uh, the uh, instrument God used was the Babylonians. So judgment is about to uh, to ultimately fall again Jonah had preached successfully uh, repentance uh, to them uh, nearly a hundred years earlier uh, they had repented but now the judgment that was uh, prophesied by Jonah is going to is again being prophesied by uh, Nahum and it is prophesied uh, that it is going to come as sure as the sun rises it's it, it is definite it is final so let's get into our lesson text and more could be said about the background uh, not much is known of uh, Nahum he's not mentioned in any other uh, book of the Bible uh, not quoted in the New Testament uh, except to perhaps in one verse in Romans and don't have that at my fingertips now but they are, um, he is uh, uh, been used of God uh, in the, the three chapters of the book to uh, again pronounce judgment on Nineveh because of its wickedness and its great uh, unrighteousness and then to proclaim the salvation for Judah. 
Now, it's unfortunate that within a few years, uh, Judah has spiraled down to uh, decad in their decadence and idolatry to a point where God has to begin to judge them in 605 uh, B.C. Again, Nineveh, Nineveh fell in 612 B.C. And he used the same instrument, the Babylonians, to uh, to, to uh, lay siege uh, of Jerusalem and ultimately in 596 B.C. Um, take the, 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 the rim, take uh, all those who uh, Babylon could use uh, captive and uh, left the remnant of people in the land of Judah. So let's get into again our, our lesson text again um, from the adult quarterly, Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. The first division is no escape, no escape, and that's covered between Nahum chapter 1. I'm sorry, back up. The first division is a jealous God. That's covered between chapter 1, verse 1 to 3a. By the way, uh, from the standard, the first division is entitled Prophecy, and that's uh, the very first verse. So, I'm going to probably read from the uh, NIV, uh, uh, just for, for greater clarity, and the first passage reads, A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Ekoshite, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. I should note that the first part of the first verse where it says a prophecy concerning Nineveh reads in the King James Version, the burden of Nineveh, the burden of Nineveh. And we see that in the King James Version, several places pronounced uh, in connection with prophecies or prophets. And it really means um, uh, it's a, a weighty um, uh, judgment typically it, it is often a prophecy that thought that is, is is concerning a judgment and it's 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 not a trivial matter it's a weighty matter uh, and so uh, it's in all caps here in the NIV I guess to, to illustrate that and this is the book of the vision of Nahum the ecocyte now the vision is another way of saying uh, prophecy being revealed uh, in this book. So the difference between um, a vision, I guess, and just a, a prophecy is that the, the vision involves uh, a revelation uh, and then also the understanding or wisdom to understand what the revelation or its significance is. So that's the difference between a vision and a prophecy. Oftentimes, as you may know, a uh, prophet spoke of things that they really did not understand. Uh, uh, the Lord just used them uh, and to speak prophecies that would be understood uh, in later years. But in this case, uh, the understanding was clear. And it calls, uh, it says the vision of Nahum. So it was a, a prophecy with understanding wisdom and understanding that God gave through Nahum the Ekoshite and we don't know much about uh, Ekosh which is believed to be uh, a few miles south of south of uh, Judah uh, but other than that um, not much is said about uh, Ekos or maybe it's pronounced it Ekosh so this Nahum's prophecy uh, differed from the one that Jonah offered uh, some hundred years earlier uh, in uh, two ways. Uh, first, Nahum uh, was told to preach in Judah about Nineveh, not to go to Nineveh itself as Jonah had. 
And number two, uh, Nahum's prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, Jonah's was unfulfilled because God chose mercy over judgment uh, when the people repented. Uh, but again, the judgment is finally falling. So um, let's move on to verse 2. God is, well, uh, from the NIV, let me stick with that. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord, and it's all caps here, meaning the Jehovah, the self-existent one, takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Now, let's clear up something right away, because usually when we use the word jealous, we're speaking uh, of a negative attribute. Uh, of course, the Lord has no negative attributes, and this word zealous, or jealous rather, could also be understood as zealous or fervent, uh, and really it speaks of, of God's uh, caring and commitment, his profound sense of caring and commitment to his people, to those he were in, he was in covenant with. So where, where we see uh, jealousy spoken in connection with the Lord, uh, we're generally talking about his zeal, his fervency, his profound sense of caring and commitment uh, to care for uh, his people. So we notice that um, that is repeated, that the Lord, it says in that verse, uh, verse 2, jealous and avenging God, okay, um, and, uh, he recompenses uh, those who've done uh, evil uh, against his people. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. This is a righteous indignation. Uh, this is not uh, to be compared with the wrath of man. Uh, men can be wrathful over anything, whether it's important or whether it's righteous or not. And then it says again, the Lord takes vengeance again on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. So why the repetition there? Well, we see that uh, when emphasis is being placed on what is being pronounced. Um, so that's why his wrath, his vengeance and his wrath is repeated twice for greater emphasis on uh, the Lord's uh, uh, disposition toward his enemies, his enemies being the focus of his enemy, uh, focus of his wrath, rather being the Assyrians. Capital of Assyria again was Nineveh, and so Nineveh is going to be utterly destroyed. And again, that's going to uh, portend uh, uh, the uh, the downfall of Assyria as a, as a world power. Verse three a. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will leave the guilty, will not rather leave the guilty unpunished. Again, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. And let me read the rest of that verse. Uh, I'll read it entirely from the, NI, um, the King James Version. It says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And actually we'll pick up that part B in the next division. But the Lord does not make snap decisions about judgment. Uh, in fact, he is very patient. He's waited some hundred years before ultimately judging um, Assyria and Nineveh specifically. Uh, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, uh, the Lord is very patient with first the northern kingdom uh, in their constant descent. Uh, every king that sat on the throne from the very first one was an evil, did evil in the sight of the Lord and caused the people to sin greatly. And they were idol worshipers and they spun downward from the very beginning when the kingdom was divided. The southern kingdom had some kings that did what was good and right in the sight of the Lord. 
uh, Hezekiah, Josiah. There were a few others that did what was good and right in the sight of the Lord. And so their downward spiral was slower. The Lord was more patient with them. In fact, if you remember the Lord, uh, and, and, by, and by the way, um, Assyria at this time, at the time of the prophecy, uh, had made the southern kingdom a vassal, uh, and they had attempted to destroy the southern kingdom as well. You may recall uh, when Sennacherib, uh, uh, the Assyrian uh, king, came uh, up and besieged Israel and uh, was uh, attempting to destroy it, how uh, the Lord with one angel destroyed 185,000 of the Assyrians army uh, in one night and actually this uh, this had happened a little earlier this was uh, during the reign of Sennacherib between 704 and 681 BC the time of this writing by the way is believed to have been during the reign of Josiah in the southern kingdom or Judah uh, sometime between 625 and 612 BC uh, is when this uh, was written and, and of course as I mentioned uh, Nineveh was actually destroyed in 612 BC but all that to say uh, the Lord had, had demonstrated great patience and he does demonstrate great patience even with us Lord Jesus, you know, uh, we, we could have all died before we came to know uh, Jesus as Savior. Uh, we could have died in our sins, but the Lord was patient with us until uh, we came to faith in Christ. And now we have eternal salvation. We have salvation. We have eternal life through faith in him. So the Lord demonstrates great patience. He's not, he doesn't snap. Uh, uh, he doesn't make any snap judgments about when to uh, judge uh, his people or uh, those who uh, don't know him those who sin against him those who have not accepted him all right let's uh, now let's move into the second division of the quarterly which is entitled condemnation and vindication I'm sorry <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting my divisions mixed up here sorry about that the second one is entitled no escape no escape, and that's covered between verses one, uh, chapter one, verses three b and six to eight. So from the NIV, the second part of verse three is his way is in the whirlwind and storm and clouds, or the dust of his feet. Let's go back to part b of a rather. It says the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. So what's he saying in the second part of that verse? The Lord demonstrates his great power in nature. The whirlwind, uh, the hurricane, the tornado, which recently came through uh, from the uh, southwest to the central uh, Midwest and destroyed uh, billions of dollars in property and, and cost many lives. Uh, the Lord demonstrates his great power and it goes on to say and the clouds are the dust of his feet, of his feet. you know we know how uh, high and how billowy uh, majestic the clouds are if you can imagine them being the dust of his feet it speaks of his great power his, his awesomeness is what that speaks of now we're going to jump down to verse 6 but verses uh, 5 and 6 um uh, basically cover the uh, Nahum continues to uh, describe God's power in terms of his authority over the forces uh, and features of our world so uh, God doesn't have to prove uh, his power to do anything uh, he, his, his acts in nature and through nature demonstrate his great power so picking up at verse 6 who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. Now again, it's still speaking of uh, his great power and the fact that no one can 
withstand his power, the power that uh, is exerted because of his righteous indignation. Uh, it talks about, uh, again, him working through nature. We can envision the power of a volcano and how the volcano uh, spews uh, fire but also sends rocks molten rocks uh, miles into the air uh, he is he's demonstrating just a fraction of his power in nature through uh, such things again as a, 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 an erupting volcano and the lava that spews from it destroys everything in its path verse 7 the Lord is good I'm sorry let me back up no that's it verse 7 the Lord is good a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Uh, that reads pretty much the same as the NIV, which I'm sorry, with the King James Version, which I started to read. Again, the Lord is good. A refuge or place of refuge or protection or safety in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Who are those who trust in him? Uh, in the uh, throughout the Old Testament, it was his covenant people, or oftentimes just a remnant of his covenant people, the Jews, the Hebrews, okay, and proselytes, those who Gentiles who converted to Judaism. Uh, now it's Christians. Uh, it's it's those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, who trust Him for salvation uh, and for power to live uh, the. Uh, the Christian to walk the Christian walk to live the Christian life the power of the Holy Spirit we have become partakers of the divine nature through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through our trust in him what he did on the cross for us uh, and so that's who we're talking about here uh, he uh, is a refuge for us he's a place of protection for us in times of trouble and then he cares for those who trust him he he, he, he constantly cares for us and he constantly protects his own. Verse 8 But with an overwhelming flood he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of the darkness. So he is stating it as plainly as it can be stated here. The judgment of Nineveh. Again the capital of Assyria. He says, with an overwhelming flood, will he will make an end of Nineveh. Now, it just so happened that Nineveh was along the Tigris River. And there was a tributary that actually fed into the Tigris River. And one of the things that the Babylonians did, and other uh, conquering nations did uh, from time to time, is they would dam up rivers of... Uh, that were above the cities they were besieging or wanting to conquer and then break the dam suddenly so that the flood would come uh, through the city and destroy uh, the walls and, and destroy much of it. Uh, it it's, was told, I was reading uh, in one background about Nineveh that it had walls that were a hundred, a wall that was a hundred feet high and that's really hard to imagine uh, something that was uh, constructed uh, so long ago being a hundred feet high but the water the flood of water undermined the walls, the foundation of the wall and the wall came crumbling down and so Nineveh was destroyed ultimately by this flood this overwhelming flood that he's speaking about in verse 8 and he says uh, he will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness and what what does all that mean that means they were going to be they were going to disappear basically Nineveh was not was going to be destroyed and never rebuilt many cities in, th throughout antiquity were destroyed and new cities were built on top of their foundations on top of the rubble rather or those cities were rebuilt but Nineveh would not be uh, rebuilt and has not been uh, so that's what he's saying with the re into the realm of darkness, the realm of forgetfulness, the realm of disappearing, basically, where it's going to utter utterly 
uh, disappear, vanish from the scene. Now, we're moving to the last division, which is entitled Condemnation and Vindication. And that's covered between chapter 1, verse 12, 13, and 15. And the passage reads, beginning at verse 12, This is what the Lord says, Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. And then jumping down to 15, look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Now backing up to verse 12, again it reads, this is what the Lord says. Now, Nahum is quoting the Lord, Jehovah the self-existent one, the Almighty. This, again, the Lord is in all caps. He says, he's quoting him verbatim, although they have allies and are numerous. Who's he talking about? The Assyrians. The Assyrians had uh, uh, allies of other nations. They had uh, political alliances, uh, and but also they were quite a numerous people. But what he's saying is, uh, no matter the numbers, they were no match for God, and they should not have any false security in their numbers is what he's saying it because of their numbers uh, do you remember uh, from Jonah I think uh, it said he, he, he was it took him I don't know how many days to walk across the city it was I think it was supposed to be uh, so many uh, uh, I've forgotten whether it was 120 miles around or through but it was a, it was a huge city uh, and uh, very numerous uh, uh, in population but again they were not to have any false security because of their numbers and then he, he goes on to say um, they they will be destroyed and pass away he says although I have afflicted you Judah I will afflict you no more now he had used again Assyria to judge the northern kingdom uh, he had used them to afflict the southern kingdom as I mentioned uh, they had become uh, vassals they were uh, constantly which means they paid tribute to them uh, no doubt uh, they were influenced by their paganism their false idols they had disrupted has di had disrupted uh, their true worship of, of their God uh, and so what uh, God is telling them through Nahum is that I have afflicted you. I've allowed them to make you vassals, uh, but I will afflict you no more. And we know the Lord uh, uh, very often uh, when he pronounces judgment on his own people. Uh, and he used many, many prophets in the Old Testament to do that. Uh, at the end of that prophecy of judgment, uh, or later he uh, pronounces uh, some relief, uh, some uh, uh, re restoration, uh, and some rescue of them. And that is what he's doing now. Well, he's used them, he's afflicted, used uh, Syria to afflict them. He will do that no more. And then he says, um, now he will break the yoke. This is this um, submission uh, this 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 sub subjection to Assyria that they had been placed under uh, this yoke he would break the yoke from their neck and tear uh, your shackles away this is figurative language here they're not necessarily enslaved but certainly they've been greatly intimidated uh, by the Assyrians and they the, the Assyrians have been a thorn uh, in their uh, in their side if nothing else and I want to just take a this, since we are have one verse in between let's look at verse 14 and it goes on to say from the 
King James Version, the Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer, or yeah, perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Now he switched from talking to Judah and talking, he's talking with the Assyrians again and further explaining how they are going to be judged. So then in verse 15, he's talking uh, to Judah again. He's pronounced the judgment, by the way, of Nineveh and Assyria to, to the Judeans, to Judah. Okay, uh, this is so that they would know that their relief was coming. Okay, that their enemy was going to be judged and God was going to give them the long-awaited and I'm sure prayed for relief. He says, look, they're on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news. This was a herald. You know, they uh, often in antiquity, they sent runners, uh, those healthy young men who could run for many, many miles without stopping to bring news from town to town. So a herald would, would be bringing good news or the gospel okay good news means the gospel and generally it's it was something that was pronounced by a uh, king uh, and something that was spread throughout uh, uh, his, his kingdom uh, by again runners or by heralds uh, he says who proclaims peace now that should ring a bell at this time of year. We know some heralds that proclaim peace on the night that Jesus entered time and space and was born uh, in a stable. Uh, the angels proclaim peace on earth, goodwill to all men. He says, celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. They will not interrupt your solemn worship of me. Now he's telling them to keep the, the ceremonial law that God had given them through Moses, the festivals, the feast days, uh, to make and keep vows as the law provided uh, and not uh, uh, allow, the, or that he's, he's telling them that the wicked will not invade you, they will not interfere with your worship of me, your solemn worship of me, so return to doing that. And so, uh, again, in this this really, um, something, again, the, the whole uh, lesson can be summarized uh, with uh, two statements. Uh, number one, uh, God pronounced judgment on uh, the Assyrians, and again, the focus of that judgment was Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, because of their great wickedness in general, and and certainly against his people. Now, again, the Lord, and it, this this is is sometimes difficult for understand uh, to understand rather how the Lord can use on the one hand uh, a wicked people to judge his own people and then turn around later and judge the people that he used to judge his people. But we see that, we see that God does that. He pronounced a judgment on Babylon while he was pronouncing a judgment on Judah that he was going to use Babylon to judge them. Uh, so so all God is a righteous God. God is a just God. God is, uh, is, is not, he doesn't show partiality. Uh, you know, uh, we're told that all sin is going to be judged. I mean, uh, the soul that sinneth shall die. So the only way to avoid that, at least spiritual death, is for us to accept the payment for our sin that Christ made on the cross. Now, the second part or second statement is, again, God pronounces uh, relief for his people, relief from the judgment uh, that he has uh, inflicted using Assyria uh, uh, 
he, he's going to relieve them of that by destroying Syria. And uh, I hope that we learned a little more uh, about this uh, this passage, these few verses that we've studied today. I, I know they're, they, they may seem a bit obscure, but they do speak of both gods, right, his righteousness, his justness, his righteous indignation, uh, and he is he has in indignation against sin, against those who reject him, against those who reject in our day and age, and 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 ever since the the death of Christ on the cross, all those who rejected his son, who died, who bore the sins of the world on the cross, not just those who accept him, but all those who reject him as well. He bore their sins on the cross as well, but they have to accept the fact that he did that to be saved, to actually be delivered from their sin, from the penalty, the power, and ultimately the very presence of sin. So um, this is something that we we would not, again, as I said, normally expect to study at this time of year, but we rejoice in our Savior. We rejoice in the fact, again, that God is both just and right but he's also merciful he is the just and the justifier romans 3 26 the just and the justifier uh it might seem like a paradox how god could be both just and demand uh, righteousness but also be merciful and forgive our sins well the only way he could do that again was for christ to bear the penalty of our sin and that was his death on the cross and shedding of his precious blood so we we pray that, uh, again, we've understood this uh, passage a little better than we did before. And we ask God's blessings upon all the hearers, all the households and families represented. And Lord, we ask that you would bless us. We thank you for uh, the blessings of this year, all the blessings of this past year, seen and unseen, Lord. And we ask your continued blessings on us throughout the coming year, Lord. We pray that you would stay this dread disease COVID. We pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, give godly wisdom, Lord, to our leaders, our political leaders, our judges, and our courts, our military, Lord, that you would bring sanity back to our nation, that you'd bring revival, Lord, even, that you would let the redeemed of the Lord say so, Lord. Speak out for righteousness. Speak out for what is good and right, and, and certainly, Lord, to share the gospel, the good news that Christ died for their sins. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until we see you again. May God bless and keep you.